Um, this is a talk about latency, about understanding latency and its behavior. Um, I've been giving talks about this subject for a year and some now. Um, understanding latency, how not to measure latency, latency and response time. I, I play with the wording depending on the conference. Uh, and, and the slides keep changing a lot because I have a lot of data, a lot of real stuff that comes from the real world. So same subject, but if you saw this or a recording of something in the subject a year ago, some of the messages are the same, but a lot of the content is different. One of the big things that has evolved is this used to be uh, basically the tough luck, the world is terrible, all your measurements are wrong, sorry, I can't help you talk. Um, and, and since then, I've actually done work that added tools and some code and people have started using it. So now it's a, everything you've been doing is wrong, but here's what you could do better, which, which you know, makes it not the how not to measure latency, but maybe uh, a little how to measure latency. Uh, a nickname for this talk, I've been giving variations of this inside large banks, and, and uh, the, the nickname for this talk is it's the oh shit talk. As we go through this, I just want you to think to some of the things we're going to talk about and see if you recognize them, if any of your code or some of your colleagues do this. Because this is really the beginning part of at least of this talk is, is going through all kinds of mistakes people do and misconceptions and wrongness and how they apply and to both what we measure and then how we report and present and think and make decisions based on latency or response time. So a little background about me. I'm Gil Tenet. I'm the CTO and co-founder of Azul Systems. And at Azul, um, I've been working on all kinds of interesting stuff. Probably the easiest one that most people to, to explain that most people know about is we basically solve garbage collection. So we've been working for the last decade plus on the thing. To us, GC is a solve problem. We've been focusing on what you do after you solve it. Um, and this is some evidence of me working on garbage collection. Um, those of you might recognize that contraption, that's a trash compactor in my kitchen. Trash compactor, you know, it compacts trash so you, so the old generation garbage collection doesn't have to happen as often. Um, and this one was broken because the compactor didn't work and fragments were coming out the back. So I had to actually work and fix it. And you can think, see this is 10 years ago and I thought that was funny then. Um, but, uh, you know, that's what I work on. That is all we make JVMs. We have a Zing JVM that's really good metrics. GC is so great. And then the Zool JVM, which is exactly the same as other JVMs, except that, you know, it's basically commercialized OpenGDK, nice commercial support, nice people at a good price. But that's not what this talk is about. Why am I talking about latency? Because we do a lot of metrics, and Zing pretty much sells by showing you that the outliers are gone. Um, we spend a lot of time measuring latency and response time and outliers and behaviors, and I've built a lot of experience in what people do when faced with the question of what do you want latency to look like? Or what is your latency? Or is this product any good? And, and it's a very, it, it would be entertaining if it wasn't in my way, I think. Um, there's a little bit of feedback in the speaker. Can you hear that? Okay, go ahead. Um, so let's talk about what I mean by latency behavior. And when I talk about latency, I, I use it synonymously with response time or reaction time. It's, it's the measurement of time from point A to point B or maybe around a trip or it's how fast something in your system reacts. Um, now latency is the time for one operation from point A to point B. And that's an important thing. Each operation has a different latency. No two operations have the exact same latency or usually they don't. And when we actually measure latency, what we do is measure and measure and measure and measure. And any high throughput or nice business system, you're going to have thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of these measurements. And the real question that we talk about implicitly when we talk about latency or response time is not what was the latency of this one operation, but what is the behavior of latency? We're trying to establish some language and some way to describe to us, to others, to our you know, 
it's, it's talk about requirements, about what the behavior is and what it should look like. And obviously, everybody wants it to be fast and to always be fast. But you need to describe what reality is. And behavior is not, let's see what the common case is and we're done. If that's what you do, and unfortunately, a lot of people do that exact thing, you're missing the whole point, right? You're just taking a random sample or looking at a common case or hoping that most things behave like most other things. Um, a common case is not enough to describe what the, the behavior is. And to, to test that, let me just see a few kind of, you know, hand warming exercise here. Um, how many of you care about the latency of your system? Okay, well, yeah, that was a trick question, right? Um, I mean, I, either all the other talks are really boring or, you know, you care about latency. So how many of you care about the worst case, the very worst operation in the entire day? Okay, so some of you, and by the way, this is very legitimate. It's okay to not care about the worst case. There are many applications that doesn't matter, but it is important in some cases. How about the four nines, the 99.99 percentile? A little more of you, okay. Notice the difference between the worst case and the four nines is pretty big in this room. Let's reverse this, okay. How many of you here care only about the fastest operation in the whole day? There. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, by the way, there, I've run into an application that needs that. Um, that that's what matters, but it's very rare. It's kind of a sniping kind of thing. Uh, so that's obviously that's a rare thing. We, we, we care about the day, we care about the behavior, right? So let's do something a little less absurd. How many of you only care about the good half? You realize that that's what the median measures, right? What the good half had. It doesn't tell you anything about the other half, right? Okay. How about the, only the best 90%? Okay. How about, you know, how many of you care if your users see outlier or half your users see outliers once an hour? Do you care about that? Okay. By the way, if a typical user sends, you know, interacts with your application, which is usually a few hundreds of message interactions an hour, then on the average, your users will experience the four nines. Okay? That four nine over there, half your users will see that. So, you know, keep that in perspective. That's the four nines of messages. Every web page has about 13 of those. Every session has hundreds and hundreds of those. So that's a little background. Um, now unfortunately, what I see most is this, right? Uh, people exercise latency wishful thinking. And the way latency wishful thinking works is pretty simple. Um, we learned some math in school. Right? Averages, standard deviations, statistics are great. It's a way of looking at a big data set and represented it with summaries of assuming some distributions. Um, so wouldn't it be nice if that math actually applied to what we do? And you know, it looked like that, right? Uh, if the distribution only looked like that, I could summarize it with a couple numbers or maybe three. And if I describe the average, I measure the average in the 90th and the 99th percentile, that gives me a feel for the rest is gonna look like, right? It's just, you can sort of extrapolate and project to get a feel, a curve fit, right? Another way to look at this is, if I've covered 99% of all the data, how bad can the rest of it be, right? So let's look at some reality, just to give you a feel. This is a trading system. And by the way, in all the examples I have, you can ignore the y-axis. For some people, microseconds matters, or millisecond matters, or seconds matter, or minutes matter. The concept is the same anyway. Uh, this is a trading system. And some percentiles, this is the, you know, for each percentile, what you got, you can see a very consistent system here. Very good, too. It's like 50 microseconds jumping out to 60 or 70 microseconds. It's a pretty nice system. Now, if I look at this picture, and it goes all the way past the 99%, can I learn anything from this data set about what the four nines are or what the worst case is? Is there any hint here? Okay. That math we learned in high school doesn't help right now, okay? If we expand, we start seeing that. This is real data, by the way. 
start saying that, you know, right around the three nines, there's this bump. But that's not the end of it. If we expand further, that bump is that little bump over there. And this is the actual data set we're looking at, okay? The entire spectrum, and this goes until the data is exhausted. There were just enough, I mean, this thing had only, I don't know what, a few million results, so that's it. You know, that's 100%. So, you know, when we look at this, a few things stand out. This is not a normal distribution. You cannot project from any part of the graph to any other part of the graph. And it also seems to have these jumps and nodes. And it's an interesting thing when you start looking at enough of these, you start asking, why is the jump there? And you know what the answer is most often? These were the requirements. So as engineers, your job is to make that line be below that line, and it's okay to sacrifice things that break requirement, that don't have requirements to meet requirements. So it's not a wonder that once there's this bump here, that allows people to bump up to it, and it's not a wonder that once you remove the ceiling completely and don't say any maximum above the four nines, the engineers could do whatever they want with the 4.2 nines, right? As long as it helps with the other side. And, most of engineering is a, the art of trade-offs. Money against performance, outliers against common case. It's trade-offs, and, and most of what we do is shift things around. Every once in a while, we actually eliminate work, right? which is when we really win. So another way to look at this, this is the same data set sampled across multiple runs. You can see that there, there's some kind of commonality to the to the spectrum, but also outliers between them. Each one of these is one hour. Um, but just to put to bed this whole average and standard deviation thing, let's run some actual numbers in those. That's the mean and standard deviation of this data set, of the entire set of all these lines, okay? Uh, actually, I think it's the just the purple line in this case. So. Now, note that the five nines of that line is that number, which is 184 standard deviations away from the mean of that data set. Uh, if you go back to your basic statistics math, in a normal distribution, the five nines fall within four and a half sigma. So this is a little off. And there's no mistake in anything here. This is the actual data set with no loss in the data set. This is the actual mean and standard deviation math, and that's the actual five nine. And none of this contradicts anything. All this tells you is this is not a normal distribution. That's all it tells you, right? So here's the news. I have yet to see a latency or response time graph that exhibits anything near the normal distribution. And every time you actually repeat the exercise I just had, you will find a number in your data set that is 10, 20, 30 standard deviations away from the mean, which is basically telling you everything you learned in high school or in statistics does not apply to this data set, stop, right? If there's one takeaway you have from this whole talk, if you ever see standard deviation on a piece of paper next to a latency or response time number, take a black pen and erase it. It's distracting at best. Okay? It's very misleading normally. That's just, this is real data. And by the way, you do this with a human response time online retail app, you get the same kind of behavior. So, you know, this is another way of looking at the same. Here's a low latency system over a span of 10 minutes. The 99th percentile is right there. And if I just stop reporting at that point, I would miss the fact that pretty much all the time I have outliers of 20 milliseconds on this system and I'm losing money right and left. If I just stop reporting at the 99th percentile, guess what most exchanges and venues do? They report everything up to the 99th percentile. But that's it. That's 30,000% higher than your typical. Okay, so let's look at a little bit of why and background and intuition. This is, a, this is an intuitive picture we all carry in our heads um, of how response time and, la and, and load uh, interact. This is a 40-some year old slide deck from an IBM Kix server document, okay? And it hasn't really changed in intuition. You have a good range, and then you, when he loads things up, things will get worse at some point. The computer can only do so much, and if you ask it to do more than that, you start waiting in line, and you know the line gets longer. And the scalability law usually makes you hit that earlier than the knee. It's not a perfect knee there. But there are a few interesting questions to ask about this, because this drives our intuition. It drives my intuition. I, I've been talking about this for a couple of years, and I still intuitively think this way. 
The first one is when we say latency or response time, and people always say when your load goes up, the latency will get worse. What are we talking about? Is it the average or is it the max or is it the 99th percentile? If you actually plot this for each one of those, you would get a dramatically different curve. So which is it? Most people say it's the average. We'll talk about that later. That's what they usually think of. But more importantly, there's an inherent assumption here that load, the amount of work we do, is somehow a dominant factor in the behavior of response time. And that's just bullshit. It's just wrong. It's not real. It's one of the tiny things that might affect it. But response time and latency behaves the way it behaves regardless of load. Let's look at some actual load versus response time behaviors. Again, uh, I didn't measure this myself. I went to the web and said response time graphs because I'm lazy. And then I found ones I like and that serve my agenda and then I'm talking about those. Um, so the light blue line here that steps up, that's a load. This is a classic lab load generator ramping up load. The spiky black lines, that's the average response time over a short period of time. And what you notice here is these things are pretty interesting. There are very high response times at low load that are much higher than the response time at a much higher load. Yeah, the bottom of this black line seems to grow linearly with the, that, but that's not the signal. If you ignore these spikes, you're ignoring reality, you're ignoring the reason the phone rings when people are upset. They're not upset about this, they're upset about that. Okay? I call these things hiccups. And hiccups are a natural occurrence in all response time systems and all software systems that you see. Their magnitude might be microseconds, milliseconds, seconds, or bigger, but they happen. And ignoring the fact that they happen is ignoring reality and ignoring the system and how it behaves. Um, now why hiccups happen varies, but they're usually not a result of work or load. It's not, I do this much and then the hiccup happens. It's usually uh, something that has to do either with accumulated work, like I've done a lot of work, now I have to re-index my database or, or, or rotate my log file or garbage collect or I've used the CPU for the last 10 milliseconds, somebody else gets to get it now. Those are all accumulated work effects. It's not one operation that took that long. There's something big that you're paying the piper for and then you get to wait again. The other mode is it's got nothing to do even with that. It's the phase of the moon. It's just random dice hitting you, which is a form of accumulated work if you think about it. Do enough and it'll hit you. Um, so hiccups matter. Hiccups are the signal. And you know when you look at what they behave like, they are strongly multimodal. There's not one mode with a distribution around it. There are multiple modes. It's the opposite of normal distribution. And usually they look like a shift from one mode to another mode to another mode. There's usually a good mode. That's the one we all think about when we talk about the average or the typical. Then there's usually a bad mode, and usually a terrible mode, and usually some additionals, right? Each of one of those humps in the graph was that. Now, what can we do about this? Um, the most common thing to do about this, and this is an industry practice, and we're all very learned at doing this, is to do that. Let me give you instructions. You take a shovel and you use it to measure uh, standard deviation and average, and then you, you hide the data you have and you only talk about those two numbers and you've achieved this. It's very effective. True story, and this is not something that only happened once, it happens regularly, but a specific one here. I often talk to people early when they want to test our product and I want to know what they know about their behavior before we start a test. And I like to find out how they think about it, and I, after they tell me what numbers they have, I ask for numbers they didn't tell me. And that usually tells me whether they can derive numbers from a data set, because my next step is I want to ask for the data set. I don't believe their analysis usually. You'll see why. Um, in this case, you know, guy gave me a few numbers, he had an average, a 95th percentile, and a worst case. So I asked him if he's got something else, like the 99 percent, and he said, yeah, hold on a second, comes back 15 seconds later, says um, 99 percent is X, and I said, great, you probably have a log with all the responses in it, and, and you analyze that, so can I have the log, I just want to look at it, he says, I don't have a log, so I ask him, how did you figure out what the 99th percentile is, anybody want to guess, 
It's, it's right there. It's right there. Yeah. <laughs> he, well, he, he, yeah, he, exactly. He had the mean, and he has the standard deviation, and he knows the three standard deviations from the mean is where the 99.7 percentile falls, and that's close enough. Yeah. That's applying wishful thinking to your data. You have data. You throw away the data, you compute these two numbers, and you say, I wish the data looked like this, and if it looked like this, what would the 99 percentile be? And then that's what you report to your boss, that's how you capacity plan, that's what you hope you serve your customers with. Reality has nothing to do with what you just did. So this is real, and it's always wrong. It's always wrong. This is not sometimes wrong, slightly wrong, a little wrong. This is complete, complete, you know, no cow pucky. Um, so what can you do about it? You can actually take the data you have and describe that. And this is a good example of how I like, I'd like people to describe them. You take your data and you plot it, every, all of it. You don't take a number and a number and extrapolate. You plot every percentile you have. And you have the data to do it, if you don't get rid of it early. And if you plot it in a, in a behavior like this, for example, an x-axis of percentiles and a y-axis of that, one of the nice things about it, you can also draw requirements in that. And it's really easy to tell when you have requirements whether you break or meet the requirements. And another very important thing here is this makes for a really good boss picture. That's a picture. It's much easier than numbers. But it also helps focus where you want to spend your time, your energy, your effort. If you have a system that doesn't meet requirements and you send it back to the engineers, they're going to try and make it faster. And you're going to repeat that cycle. And unfortunately, most engineers will try and make that faster. That's the common case. It's not good enough, let's make it even better. Obviously, we make it better here, it'll improve everywhere, right? Well, no, because it's a trade-off system, right? I can make that better by doubling the heap size and making this even worse, right? If you break here, you gotta work on this part. And you're already 10x better than you have to be over here. You're wasting the next two weeks of engineering if you're focused on the wrong part of the graph. This helps focus you, your boss, your team on what the problem is. And you know, if, if you don't meet this, by the way, a valid way to solve this is to say, we can't do that, raise the line. That's okay too. Just, this is reality, this is the requirement, are we meeting it? Let's talk about this thing, these requirements. Why is it that we measure latency to begin with? Other than the fun of measuring it and measuring it and measuring it and twisting things and measuring it again, there's usually a reason. And, um, you know, we're supposed to have requirements on how the latency needs to behave. Otherwise, what are we spending all this time for? Now, a useful requirement set is always a pass-fail test. A requirement that says I want you to be fast is not a good, I don't like to start that test, okay? Please be fast, please be, please be as fast as you can. That's not a good, there's no end to that, right? But here's what I need you to do. Did you do it? Now I can start designing for that and I can, that lets me do trade-offs, right? I can, I'm good enough here, I can maybe move things around, right? Um, now, every application has potentially different needs. There are classes of applications. If you're, if you're building a trading system, you need to win. You know, being fast on average doesn't help anybody if you never are the fastest, right? Uh, if you build a heart pacer, telling your customer that 99.9% .9 of the time it'll be great is basically telling them they've got 10 minutes to live. Um, and, and so different systems have different needs, and you're supposed to build requirements that replace, reflect your application. So don't take a set of requirements from a book. You know, that's not a good way to start. And since it's your requirements, your measurements are you're supposed to measure your requirements. So don't take a set of measurements that somebody else uses that measures percentiles that you don't care about, but not the percentiles you care about. Right? That's why measuring all the percentiles is usually good. You can later do whatever you want with it. But often people take a measurement tool and it says what the 99 percentile is. And well, they don't have other numbers. So now we force the business to think only in that term. And then the business says, well, OK, I probably know what the rest does, right? Um, so this is a hard thing, by the way. 
It, it, what I went through is a very simple, logical step. Every one of you will probably go through the exact same thing. It's just most people don't bother to start this step-by-step -step thing. I need to measure what I need rather than what some science experiment that somebody else did does. So I, I like to establish requirements before I do testing. It's usually something annoying I force customers to do. We don't want you to test our stuff before you tell us what the requirement you have is, because we're probably here to solve a problem of something not meeting requirements. If you have something that's meeting requirements, I don't want to waste my time, and I don't want to waste your time. You don't need me. And if it fails requirements, let's talk about how it fails and what I need to do to win. That, that's a simple conversation. Unfortunately, when we ask people what the requirements are, most of them don't know. This is not the people being stupid, right? How many of you in this room know what the required worst case for your application is? So there, I mean, you're smart people, but your organization may not know, or at least it didn't tell you, right? Um, so I go through an interview process, and I claim that you have to extract these numbers. You can extract them from yourself or make them up, or ask your colleague or your boss or your product manager or customer. And if nobody will tell you, make it up. It's better than nothing. Do what your guesses are. And this is what the interview usually looks like. It's, uh, you know, I start with, what do you know about your requirements? And most commonly the answer is, I need an average of X. That's the most common answer I get. By the way, I've never met an application that actually needs an average of anything. I don't know what that means to an application. I'm going to do 3 million things. On the average, this is how fast they need to be. Now, it sounds like I'm nitpicking here, but a lot of the systems I measure have an average that is higher than the 99th percentile. Intuitively, that's not what they mean. Mostly, they mean the common case most of the time. That's a valid way to think about it. The only actual valid uh, requirement I've ever seen to have an average in a system is a contract that says there needs to be an average in the system. If that's what the contract says, I'm not going to argue, right? But I haven't found the what happens wrong if the average is higher or lower to the system. Yeah. So that's a typical answer. I usually translate that to, okay, you need a typical of something. Um, what is the worst case that you need? I always ask this. You cannot proceed without it. You're going to spend the next few weeks of your life measuring something without knowing what you're doing, or not knowing what you need if you don't have an answer. Or worse yet, you might design a system and build it and make design choices when you're, when you're architecting it without knowing what it's supposed to do. That's a very important number. And the most common answer to that is, I don't know. Not quite sure. Often it's something like, it's fuzzy, don't be too bad. Uh, do this number, but it's okay if sometimes it's that. But it, it's not a hard thing. It just I asked you guys, most of you didn't have a knowledge of your system or what the number is. So here's a foolproof way to establish this. This never misses, okay? That's what I ask. I say, is it okay for this system to freeze for five hours in the middle of the business day? And unless this is a Hadoop system, the answer is no. Okay? Um, so that's the answer. Now that's not the trick. The trick is the next step. Let me write this down. Cannot freeze for more than five hours. Now at this point, I guarantee you that they will correct you. This is not the requirement. Yeah. How often do you get what's your worst case? 20 milliseconds. Um, I get that, and that's the very next step. Look at this. Yeah, thanks for the softball. Yeah. Oh, uh, the question was how often uh, do I get a worst case needs to be 20 milliseconds? So I get that a lot. And by the way, there are very, a lot of systems where that's, they don't, they want much better than that, like, you know, FX trading. If you stall for 20 milliseconds, you just lost a lot of money. Oh, that's just a average typical 20 milliseconds. Oh, yeah. How fast, how fast do you want to be fast? How, what, how often all the time? Yeah, that, that's usually what the requirement is, but that's the next step. When they react to this, not five hours, write down 100 milliseconds, you have to realize they usually overreacted to something. So don't stop there. You're going to negotiate backwards. And at this point, you say, are you sure? We can try and build that, but this will cost a lot of money. We're not talking about something that will happen a lot. In fact, we're saying this is the thing that will never happen. 
you know, if this happened only once or twice a day, how, how, how bad is so bad you're not allowing me to do it? And at this point, they'll ease off to something realistic. You know, just put a price tag on it and they, they'll, they'll ease up. So in this example, I'm saying they wanted a typical of 20 milliseconds, which is not abnormal for uh, a nice, snappy, interactive system these days. Uh, but, you know, okay, every once in a while, or a two-second max is what I want. Now we have two numbers. We have a typical and we have a worst case. That feels much better than just one, but that's not nearly good enough. Here's the next question. I can do a typical of 20, a worst case, I'll never do a two. How often am I allowed to do one second? At this point, you usually have an annoyed person on the other side that says, you just told me that this will be rare and never happen. That's why I eased up on my requirement. But now you're telling me it'll happen and you're saying how often? So you explain, look, we're writing down requirements. It says right here, 50% of the time it needs to be at least this good, and the worst is that. That means that half the time I could do one second. And if that's not true, let's talk about this and write down how often I'm allowed to do one second. Now at this point, at that point, usually you're done because they'll take over and they'll figure out how many steps they want. They might even have too many steps, and they'll come up with something that looks like this multiple percentile levels with a that many need to be better than this much for each level. And it's always monotonically growing. You can't have, you know, it's silly to try and say the max is better than the average. Um, now, there have to be at least three numbers here or you do not have a set of requirements that, that makes sense, okay? There has to be a common case. There has to be a max and there needs to be one other number and it needs multiple nines. Two is a tiny number of nines. It's three or four nines in it to make sense. If we erased one of these four, it should be either the 50 or the 90. They're actually redundant. Both of them are common case, right? They're not very different. If somebody tells you that they know the 20, that one's 20 and that one's 50, they probably don't know what they really need because that's really noise. They're same order of magnitude kind of stuff. Um, if I erase the 99.9, .9, that would literally mean that it's okay for 10% of all operations to be 1.9 seconds. That's how big the signal of removing that is. And obviously, if I remove the max, it means it's okay to, for one out of a thousand to be five hours, right? So the, the strong requirements here are the higher ones, right? Okay, so that, this sequence, and I'll say it again, you can do it with somebody else, but if nobody will cooperate, just, just talk to yourself in the mirror and extract this from yourself. Um, and then at least you have something to work with and later people will start moving your numbers around and, and that's okay. So, you know, we talked about requirements and that was about latency or response time. But latency and response times don't live in a vacuum. That, that picture does have some bearing to reality. You know, you load up a system and at some point it just can't handle, handle anymore. If you ask a marketing guy how much can system can handle, they'll say, see, so many widgets per second went through the system, it can handle it, even though nobody's happy and everybody's screaming, right? If you ask the users, they'll say, that's the point where this system broke. I wasn't happy before that, but at this point, it's just totally broken. If you ask a sysadmin or somebody planning the capacity of the system, they'll say, it needs to be about there, because I don't want to be anywhere near the part where it's not flat or near the knee. And a very important number to look for is the number that happens right before everything breaks. That number is the sustainable throughput the system can handle, not the throughput the system can handle. It's not the peak. It's not some, you know, the typical benchmark. But how far can I go? How fast can I go? How much load can I carry while meeting all those requirements we just wrote down? Every single one of them. How fast can I go while still passing? It's a critical number. It's the most important number you're trying to measure. That is what capacity planning is supposed to work with. You're trying to figure that out and then say, I want headroom, so stay away from that too. So this is my definition of sustainable throughput. Okay? It's very clear. To give you a picture for this, this is not sustainable speed, but this is what most latency experiments attempt to do. So, Seeing how fast I, drive, I can drive a red car into a pole, and then spending the next two weeks measuring the shape of the bumper, tweaking the structure of the bumper, driving the car into the pole again and seeing if it changed, is the exact same thing as 
taking a brand new Xeon server, hitting the gas on it, saturating it, measuring the response time, tweaking your code, doing the same experiment again and seeing what the response time after saturation is. It's going to be terrible. You've crashed the system, you've saturated it. What are you doing trying to make that better? The actual experiment you're supposed to perform is to see how fast you can drive a red car without hitting a pole. And it's valid to crash it into the pole to figure out that that line was met. But don't waste time looking at the shape of the car afterwards. That was just to establish how fast not to go. Then ease up and try and figure out the shape. And if you're tweaking things, it should be your brakes and your tires to make sure that you can actually go faster without hitting the pole, right? So this is not sustainable throughput, and, and the entire game shouldn't be focused on measuring what happens after we break. So, you know, when I measure things or try to tell people how to measure things, I usually want to take the results and put them on charts like these. This is an example of comparing six, six different unnamed scenarios against each other. They might be different throughputs, they might be different configurations, they might be different times a day. And comparing them against some sort of a requirement. This is a simple way of declaring a requirement. This here says 90% need to be 10 milliseconds or better, 99.9 .9 need to be 20 milliseconds or better, and everything needs to be 100 milliseconds or better. That'll be a kind of a telco class or a messaging, an internet messaging class SLA, typically, right? Uh, and it's really simple. If you cross the line at any point, you're failed. It doesn't matter that you failed only a little and only a little. That's fail, right? And if you pass this blue line, it doesn't matter that it passed only a little. That's pass. And these are much better passes, but there are four passes and two failures in this chart, okay? Let's give you a real-world example. And by the way, up to now, I didn't do too much, you know, chest thumping. So let's do a little chest thumping. This is a way I compare Zing against regular hotspot JVMs when measuring the actual throughput a system can handle. This is a message delivery system. The system takes messages of certain throughput and delivers them to a variable number of endpoints. Um, this system can handle 15,000 endpoints at the throughput we're talking about, but the more endpoints you have, the harder it is. And these lines are the different rates. So at 15,000 endpoints, we handle the number, but not passing. You relax that, it's better. You relax that, it's better, but still failing. You relax it to 1K and it passes. The difference between the peak throughput that nobody wants and a sustainable throughput that nobody will call you and say you're not meeting your SLA on is 15X on this system. That's a big difference. It's not a 20% difference. So you're talking about two edges of a chart. Now on the same chart, we have Zing over here. That's our cool JVM that doesn't pause. And guess why these things happen? Because of pauses. Um, and on Zing, there are actually four lines here at 1K, at 5K, at 10K, at 15K. And you just, you, may, you might be able to see some of them apart, but they all pass. Now given this output, I can say this system can handle 15,000 endpoints, but with Zing, it can handle it within SLAs. And with Hotspot, you can handle only one fifteenth of that within SLAs. Therefore, Zinc can handle 50 times the sustainable throughput. That's a simple test. And when you need to figure out how many systems you need to deploy to keep your customers happy, that's what that translates to. Okay. So this gives you a little why I care and why we try and bring the graphs to shapes that matter. Okay, so are we have time? Okay. Um, so I talked about philosophy and what is it we want to measure and, and those hiccups and how standard deviations don't make sense and, and about requirements and about throughput and sustainable throughput and all that's great except that none of what I said so far means anything if all your data is crap. So let me tell you about how all your data is crap. There's this problem I call a coordinated emission problem. I named it, I don't remember exactly how long ago. Um, a couple of years ago, almost a year and a half ago. Um, and I noticed it and coined the term after at Azul, we spent two months of our engineering effort trying to improve a non-existent problem. 
that caused that happened because of this. So I started noticing it, and I thought it happens a little bit, and then I started noticing that every place I went and looked for it, it existed. And that scared the hell out of me, so I started building tools. That's why I call it an accidental conspiracy. At the end of this, if you have this in your systems, well, you don't have to tell all of us, but you know, drop me a note. Um, so how does this work? Um, this is a very typical example. We build a load tester to measure and beat up our systems and establish how they behave under load. A load tester is something we either build or buy. It usually has clients of some sort and they either inject, uh, they inject some sort of traffic. There could be one or many depending on what you're testing and what your real world is. And each client issues a request, waits for a response, records what happens, issues the next request. But most clients are synchronous. They run some scenario, they wait for the next thing. And they won't issue the next request until they get a response. We take all those results, we put them in statistics buckets, and we plot them. And suppose we did everything right from that point on. What's the problem here? This works well only when none of the responses took longer than it would have taken you to send the next request under the, whatever tests you were supposed to perform. You're supposed to do a certain scenario, and under the scenario you're supposed to do this, but you couldn't do it yet because the previous one didn't arrive yet. And the minute that happens, once, the entire model just breaks. You're no longer measuring your system, you're measuring only the good parts of your system. You had a question? Yeah. Oh, gotcha. Um, so there's this implicit automatic back off that happens because you're waiting for the response. And normally, normally this doesn't happen. It's rare, right? I mean, how often do you have a glitch that actually takes longer? But when it does happen, it's very dramatic. Okay, the, it, the, the effect on that, on the truth of what you're doing, is orders of magnitude effects on reporting. This is the common case. Here's the other common case. This is the one where you're just measuring inside your system. So, I, you know, you have an operation, you want to know how long it takes, and you want some stats on it, so you take a timestamp before you do the operation, you take a timestamp after, throw this in some statistics bucket and report on it later. I don't know how else to do that, but this has a problem. It has two problems. The first one is, if you get stuck during that operation, it's one long operation, it'll show one long operation, but it won't show that there are 10,000 other operations waiting to get into this time window. And when they do come in, they all look really happy, right? Because they're fast. If I stop the system, control Z it, I'll only see one bad result. But even worse, when you measure inside the server, this doesn't happen from the outside, only inside, you have this other problem where you're measuring part of the system. This, by the way, is a snippet of code from Cassandra and how it reports it re its read stats. Okay, just to give you a feel for how prevalent this is. Um, and Cassandra is often used as a write-mostly database. Say 95% writes, 5% reads, this is the read. There's a 95% chance that if a pause happens in this system, it will happen outside of this code, and you won't even have that one big result to show. So there's nothing to even extrapolate or indicate on. Both of these are examples of coordinated emission. The system did something bad, and our measurement coordinated with it in a conspiracy to erase the bad results, okay? Um, so let's give you a hypothetical situation that's easy to demonstrate the effect on. We'll take a perfect system. This perfect system, I'll define it as a, it does 100 requests a second with one thread and one client. The same will apply if you have multi-threads and multi-clients, but this is simple. And each one is a perfect one millisecond. That's easy to describe, right? Now, we'll do something to this system. After 100 seconds of perfect operation, I'll hit Control Z on the keyboard, count off 100 seconds, and then let it go again and repeat. Now, let's describe this not with measurements, but as people. What can we say about this system? On the left side, it's pretty clear that the average is one millisecond for the first 100 seconds. That's the definition of the system. On the right side, the average is 50 seconds. Why 50? Because depending on when I come in here, I'll get somewhere between 100 and zero. On the average, it'll be 50. The overall average will be 25 seconds if I randomly pick a spot in, in this 200 second thing and repeat and repeat and repeat. 
that's a fairly intuitive way to describe it. Let's use percentiles. The 50th percentile is one millisecond, but that's the highest percentile that still looks good. And after that, things start getting bad really quickly, and the 99.99 .99 percentile is pretty close to 100 seconds. This is intuitive, this would be honest. If this was the system and this is how I described it, I described the system probably fairly. Now let's measure this system with the techniques I just talked about before, with a load runner, a J-meter, uh, um, uh, a grinder, your favorite load generator, um, or with timestamps in, inside your code and see what the data sets will be. Remember, it's all about putting statistics in buckets. So on the left side, we would get 10,000 results that show one milliseconds each. Good. On the right side, we will get one result that shows 100 seconds. And that's all we will get. Let's do math. That's the average, not 25 seconds, right? Here are the percentiles. In the statistics bucket, we collect with any of the techniques I just showed, which is pretty much all the techniques all loaders do except for asynchronous ones. The 99.99 percentile of this system that is completely broken for entirely half the time is still perfect. That's what your data will show. And that's a problem. Now what happened here? We were supposed to measure 10,000 results every, 10, every 100 seconds. We did that on the left. We can't cheat and stop doing it on the right without coordinating with the system. But because our measurement coordinates with the system, it stops measuring when things are bad. So there would have been all that, and if we did measure all those, we would have gotten exactly the numbers in our description. Ooh. But effectively, coordinate emission is the erasure of all the bad results, except for one. We leave one in there so that you'll think we measure bad results. That's yeah. One yeah, one per client. There'll be one per client. If you run a 16 client thing, you'll see 16 bad results. And there'll be, you know, 16,000 missing ones, right? right? Okay, so that's basically what happens here, right? And as a result, we get all the bad results. Now, this is pretty bad. Um, a common reaction I have at this point from people is, Okay, so it's bad, but I can still use it for intuition, right? Good is good and bad is bad, and if I make the system better, at least the numbers will improve. I know they don't mean what they mean, but at least I can use it, right? So just to counter that fallacy, let me give you a simple example. I'll fix the system. Not perfectly fix it, but instead of completely doing nothing for 100 seconds, I'll make it do everything except a little slower, right? Every operation is 5 milliseconds instead of 1, and let's measure that. I'll get 10,000 of this, 10,000 of that, and here are the percentiles. Now, if I, me if I compare the two measurements, and I spent a lot of time to improve the system to be this much better, it just showed me that the 99.9% .9 I'll get five times worse. So I must have done the wrong thing. Let's throw away that work. Go back to the other system. It's better than this, right? So intuition doesn't work either. Right? Whenever you start erasing your bad data, none of the rest matters, right? All you're looking at is the stats of the good stuff. And actually, the more bad data you erase, the better your data will look, right? So when we were spending two months fixing a non-existent problem, it was because we were eliminating pauses. And as a result, we were eliminating other outliers. And uh, sorry, sorry, we eliminated our pauses, and as a result, other outliers existed in the data set that would have not been there if you just didn't look. And we found that you know, our average was higher, but when we fixed it and corrected all this, we found that we were actually better from the beginning, and we we're trying to improve a gap that wasn't, and we're doing exactly this. We're improving the system, and it kept getting worse. Like, I mean, measurements showing worse. Okay, so this is the hypothetical, but it's also very real. This is J-meter measuring the system I just showed you on the top. This is correct the J-meter. We actually hired an intern last summer and he built a fixed J-meter that does the same thing. Um, this is YCSB measuring Cassandra. Anybody here use key value pairs for anything? Um, it, capacity planning for that usually is done with some stress test and YCSB is one of the common ones, at least for academic papers. It's a very simple test. You have one thread that issues a request into a key value store at a certain rate. You tell it what rate to do it in, and it reports that output with those percentiles. This was Cassandra. We know it is because that's what it was. It had 20 gigabytes of heap. 
And unsurprisingly, it, have a 20, it had a 26 second pause in the middle of this long test. Um, given that it was so long, and it was 1.29% of the overall time, we can do math with that. We could show that 0.29, which is what's left after, after we ignored the 99%, would have been at least 5.9 seconds. So the 99th percentile has to be at least that big, which is a thousand times what the benchmark actually is reporting. And if you use that to figure out how many memcache boxes you need or how many Cassandra boxes you need to maintain a certain required level of 99th percentile, well, this is how good it is, okay? It's, it's, it's probably worse than measuring the phase of the moon. Um, other real examples, this is a before after picture on an actual uh, prospect. Uh, the requirement, this is a payment system, and the requirement was for 99.9% .9 of things to be less than one second. Their lab tests were showing that it was, but their production was not doing that. And we went in and just took the log and corrected it, and we found that their actual log showed these numbers, and there were 7x off at exactly the requirement point. By the way, this is JMeter, and this is the first graph I'm showing you, a chart I'm showing you, where you can see coordinate emission with your bare naked eye. When you see one of these vertical rises, that's what coordinate emission looks like on a percentile graph. Now, it's not the only thing that makes that happen. There are rare cases where you will see that modality vertically because you have something that's either fast or slow and nothing in between. Uh, but if it's systemic, it'll look like that. Um, and by the way, that correction is simply filling in the gaps. If you, if you go to this JMeter log, all you have to do to see the gap is to say, hey, look, there's some latencies hard that are four seconds. Let's go to the four second latency point in the, in the line. Look at that, or actually it's uh, up here, right, the seven second. You find your seven seconds, you find a grouping of 16 results there. Then you see a seven second gap in the log, and then you get more results. You can see the gap, that black thing is right there in the log. It's really easy to go find it, right? Just scroll into your log and find the gap. If the gap's not there, maybe you don't have it. Unfortunately, it's there in most places. This is another real world one. Vertical rises, coordinate emission. Um, this is a low latency Wall Street trading platform. Nine microsecond typical <coughs> operation through the system. Really, really cool but it has some glitches that are up to half a second every once in a while. Guess why, right? Um, and here, we didn't have a problem where the customer didn't know what was going on. They were just trying to explain to their bean counters why they need sp to spend money on a problem that only affects their eight nines. So I went and spent time with them to help them correct their measurements in the system. And the challenge here was this was not a load test. This was the real world. And in the real world, we don't know what's supposed to happen. We don't have a scenario. We don't know when the next thing was supposed to arrive to recreate it. So we had to build a moving estimator with a cap to be able to generate this. And once we corrected the charts, this is what the real lines look like. It's three orders of magnitude apart. And the reason we cared here is Zing was down here. And we were trying to just, everything was done. They wanted to buy this thing, but they had to explain it. And you know, once you fix the output, it's pretty easy to explain that instead of affecting the seven or eight nines, you're affecting something that's happening 100 times a second on the average. That's an easy discussion. Yeah? So uh, you were describing the coordination uh, before it's happening, you were physically declining that held up. Uh, it, didn't, it wasn't offering one while uh, something was delayed. Mm -hmm. Here, uh, it was all day, presumably. So, to, I'll summarize the question for the camera. The question is pretty much in the previous cases I was showing how in a load generator the data was the, the load wasn't offered, so that was the coordination. This is the second case. It's measured inside the server. The server isn't serving requests, so the times for those requests haven't started. Yeah, they're waiting, but nobody recorded the fact that they're waiting. The timestamps on and don't say anything. So that's what you get. Well, they were logging what they could. And this is, uh, reality is that way. Sometimes you don't have other data. And this is a very common thing. 
it's very common to look at a system and say, it's glitching. Which of my 14 steps is glitching? Let's measure each step. Yeah. And then you have this. So um, I'll do quick suggestions and then see if people want to stick around a little longer. Um, whatever your measurement system is, test your measurement system first. And don't waste your time looking at results for real stuff before you did a sanity check. Control-Z is your friend. You can create exactly the scenario I described here, or one that pauses for 10% of the time or whatever it is. And if you make a system do something bad and your test generator doesn't tell you it did something bad, none of the rest of the data means anything from it. So don't waste your time looking at that data, okay? The first thing to do is calibrate your tools. Don't, you know, basically don't ever, ever look at standard deviation. We talked about that. Always measure max time. It's the easiest way to do sanity check without the rest of the picture. So usually the max time will tell you something is weird in the rest of the data set. And measure lots of percentiles. Hopefully all the percentiles. Okay? Now at this point, we are four minutes from the end of the official time slot, but we're the last talk of the day. So if you guys want to stick around, I've got some more material. We could do Q&A and such. This was the part of how bad things are. There's the how good things are too, or how, what to do about it. And I've got a few tools for you on that. Just show of hands, do people want to stick around for another 10, 15 minutes? Okay, I think that's, that's a good one. Okay, so let's talk about tools. The first one is something I call HDR histogram. Um, and it, I built it inside something, I, another tool I built, then people started ripping out just this piece, so I just put it up separately. Um, HDR histogram stands for High Dynamic Range Histogram, and it's what lets you plot percentiles like this. I've been using it for the entire talk. In order to be able to plot these charts and be able to get your eye, when you start looking at these shapes, starts learning what to look for. You can see that this is a three-mode system. You can see the vertical rises. You can see the vertical rises in, in the chart as a, as a hint of coordinate emission. Um, and basically, you learn a lot from it. Um, but to do this, you need both dynamic range and good resolution. The dynamic range is there because I don't know what the latency range you have is. Is it 10 microseconds or 10 hours? I don't know. Um, the resolution is there because if I didn't have good resolution, then the top quarter of this graph would be one big pixel. Right? And they can tell the shapes. So HDR histogram is really there to solve a challenge where regular histograms, for whatever reason, have not been built to deal with dynamic range very well and resolution at the same time. We have linear histograms. They're great at resolution, terrible at range. If I want to cover a microsecond to an hour with one microsecond resolution near the microsecond, I need 3.6 billion buckets. Probably not going to do that. Linear doesn't work, but logarithmic, it's great at the dynamic range part, but I can't tell the difference with half an hour and an hour, or two seconds and four seconds. So I, I get these quantiles, right? And then arbitrary histograms are the worst because you need to know exactly what you measure before you measure it. Hard to build a library for that. So HDR histogram basically lets you say, I want to cover from this number to that number with this many decimal points. And it does the rest. It creates a data structure for collecting that information. Um, it has built-in optional correction for coordinate emission. So if you know what an expected interval between things are and you have a result, just tell it that result with this expected interval, it'll do the rest. It'll recreate those 10,000 missing results for you if that's what's missing. Basically, it'll take the value and drop the interval and drop the interval, and recording each one until you get to 2x the expected interval, and then it'll stop. So up to the expected interval, or 2x that, it won't recreate anything. But once it sees a glitch, it'll fill in the gap. It's really good for post-correction of logs as well. This is all open source, actually public domain code. It's up on GitHub. You guys could go play with it. And there's, I built a Java version of this. There's now a C port of HDR histogram on the same GitHub project. And people are working on Python and JavaScript as well. Um, it's cool in that it's fixed cost in both time and space. This is a constant size data structure that does not grow zero allocation. Um, you can log a trillion things into it, it, it doesn't matter. Um, 
And it's also constant time in that there's no searches. You just take a number, you do some PID twiddling, increment one cell in memory, and you're done. So it's really fast. On this laptop, I can record 200 million things into an HDR histogram every second. It's cheaper than measuring time. So you can afford to get a ton value, you can afford to put it in a histogram. Um, the internals of it look a little like a big floating point number, not quite, but think of it like a floating point number. It's got an exponent part and a mantissa part. The exponential part gives me the dynamic range, the mantissa gives me the resolution. That's logically how I think about it. And it lets you plot these things. In fact, on GitHub you have the Excel sheet for this and a GitHub uh, GNU plot script that generates similar plots. And to make those plots, it's got nice methods that output this format of text where those two columns are the x and y axis of that chart. Now why, this is the value, that's the percentile, but when you chart these, you actually want to chart one over one minus percentile, because that's what makes the shapes make sense. So it's pre-computed for you here on the x axis. So all this is just convenience that it's there. Um, there's a new feature I put in in the last few weeks, which is logging. Um, so I defined a log, an interval log format for it, and in the interval log, you can actually take a full fidelity histogram compressed and record it for every interval. So say, that's the latency for the last five seconds, the entire spectrum, next five seconds, next five seconds. This compresses extremely well. Five seconds of latency measured every millisecond fits in about two to 400 bytes for most behaviors. Which means that you can then later do stuff like production log this and say, what was the latency distribution yesterday between 8 a.m. and 8.05 p.m.? Because something strange happened and I'm trying to figure out what, what it looked like. And you could go back in the log and reconstruct any range. The reason you could do that is histograms are additive. It's valid to take multiple histograms, add them together, and ask what the percentiles across the addition is. It is not valid to do the percentiles of different intervals and then do math across them. The percentile in this interval and the percentile of that interval are interesting separately, but there's nothing you can conclude about them together. If you keep the raw histogram information, you can do the math. What was the question? Oh, the question was the bins don't change from one to the next. This is the same histogram with the same range and the same resolution over and over again, so they're additive. In fact, you can actually add them even if they're not the same, because you're just adding uh, counts at values. So you, it's valid to add two histograms that are not the same range. This, this say this not the same resolution, for example. Um, it's used in a bunch of existing tools, JHICA being one of them. Um, latency utils is another. So latency utilities is another fairly young tool that I put together and it was there to solve this problem. I showed you the code problem. This is what everybody does. That's what that client on Wall Street did with the I9s, and there I had to go there and help them figure out and put a histogram and measure and build an estimator and all kinds of games, and I don't want to do that every time. So I was trying to figure out how I can fit into exactly that without any new code, I mean, without a lot of code. And latency stats basically is an object you could put in that location in your code and put your latency in it, and it'll do all the rest magically under the hood. Cool thing there is I started off saying I can't do that, so that means I had to try to do that. Um, it's got a little bit of magic in it. So it's supposed to be a magic fix for the in-process coordinate emission case, specifically for the case where the process stalls. Not where you have a long operation in a pipe, but the process stops, right? Uh, and the way it actually works under the hood is, since you're recording all the stuff into it, it also keeps, tracks of the, it keeps track of the intervals of recording. And it has a moving average estimator of basically how fast you're recording, and it's time capped, and you can configure all this. So it can say, well, you're recording 10,000 things a second for the last second, because I can see the recording. It also has systemically a pause detector, and that's for the entire process, not per object. And that's a consensus pause detector. You can figure how many threads and what they do. The default is three threads sleeping for a millisecond each, and they won't consider anything a pause unless all three of them saw a glitch that it's at least an, an extra millisecond. Which means if three guys saw a glitch at exactly the same time, there's a, that's a pause. You can decide it's 20 that need to see it. And what it does with that is every time it detects a pause, it tells all the latency stats buckets that a pause happened, so they all recreate 
they, they project their intervals into the missing parts, recreating missing results according to magnitude. And it keeps all this internally in HDR histograms under the hood. This is all nice, fast, non-blocking, safe, blah, blah, blah. Um, and it reports back with HDR histograms. So you can ask the latency stats bucket what the histogram is for the last interval. You can ask for the raw histogram. You can ask for the corrected histogram. You can compare the two. You can log both. That's how you get output like I showed you. And you know this is somewhat young. Only about 10 people have used it outside of me. So it might still have a few bugs, but it's also public domain code on GitHub. The last tool here is jhiccup. This one makes pictures. Well, not real, but it's got a tool in it that makes pictures. It lets you collect logs for your system or your JVM that lets you draw this about it. And the nice thing here is it comes in the form of a Java agent uh, that you can attach on any process. I don't need to know what your application is. I just need to say run, pad this Java agent to your JVM, and I will give you a plot of the hiccups in the JVM. Think of it as it logs the discontinuities of execution in the JVM. Um, and the, the, the technique is very, very simple. It just has a thread that goes to sleep for a millisecond, wakes up and says, how long has it been? And if it's been longer than a millisecond, yeah, well, that was a hiccup. Somebody saw a hiccup. Um, now, it's used for a lot of continuous in-production logs of this because of the recording of histogram things. So it uses the interval histogram log and you can later come back and do that stuff. But it's very useful for triaging where problems are when you're looking for them. So what we usually do is run a, an agent and you tell the agent to, stall, to start another process that's idle, that's doing hiccups on nothing, just looking at hiccups in the system. And then if there's some observed hiccup in your application that you saw in your response time, you could say, well, what part of the system is responsible for this? Let's look at the logs. If both the control hiccup and my JVM hiccup have a glitch of the same magnitude at the same time, that's probably the system glitching on me. Let's see if the CPUs are loaded or if the hypervisor glitched me or I don't know what. If the system is happy and your JVM is glitching, well, it's the JVM's fault. Go look at the garbage collector or it's some other thing the JVM does to pause. If both of them are happy and you're seeing a glitch, it's not the JVM, it's not the system, it's your code or the network, or something else. You don't need to look under the hood there, right? Just that triage is very valuable, especially when you're trying to figure out why some glitch happened when somebody's on the phone complaining about it. Uh, in trading, this is an important capability. Uh, but let's use some examples. The first thing I ask people to do with jhiccup is run it on an idle system. You'd be surprised what you find out. You think your system is idle. Now, why do I do this? Because Usually our success rate here is something like make sure the worst case drops below 10 milliseconds or 2 milliseconds or something, right? So I want to know what they can do when nothing happens. And if they show me that their idle system has 20 millisecond glitches, I know I can't win. We need to tune their system before we even put the product on it, right? By the way, you want to guess at what makes this happen most often? Hmm? Hard disk? This is idle, nothing's happening. Nothing's happening. The most common case for this is a cron tab job. Nothing's happening except that 20 minutes after the hour, the thing runs for 30 milliseconds, eating up all the CPUs and letting them go. Top doesn't know this happened, but Jacob will see it. Okay. Um, you can get Linux to do this. This is a half millisecond words observed case. That's a good system. That's ready for testing if you're low latency. No, there's nothing wrong with this system if you're like a human response time app. 20 milliseconds is fine. But you should know what your idle system, that's your noise level, that's the background noise. Then you can use it to compare scenarios, like this is parallel GC against G1 GC running a one gig heap and an eight gigabyte thing with an EH cache. Play with it, see what the shapes are. You can learn a lot from behavior. I never knew that G1 has these nice patterns until I ran this. You know, it has numbers, but look at the, you know, other guys just spike. Um, and you can obviously do what I really wanted to do with it. This is a quote from, you know, Charles Nutter, the J. Ruby guy. It's an honest description of why I built J. Hiccup. Okay. So how do I do that? That's hotspot on the left, Zing on the right, same application, same heap, same everything. Can you see how much more beautiful Zing is? Well, it might not be apparent until I highlight the scale. 
and then I'll normalize the scale. The reason I didn't start here, people say there's no data there. It's hard to show that you're a thousand times better when you only have 500 pixels. And this is literally a thousand times better. Why? Because we limited garbage collection, so everything else is, you know, that, that's the big glitch reason. Uh, in low latency, it's the same kind of picture. This is a before, after, it's just different scales. You know. um, I usually don't talk to people in trading about how I eliminate eight, minute, eight second pauses. They don't have them because they only have them at night and they restart at night. But they really care about that. So um, that's pretty much what Jacob is for. It has one other very useful feature. I call it the secret file mode, where you tell, tell it, don't measure anything. Just take all the input from a file. And in that mode, it can correct other people's logs. So you can take, a, say, a JMeter log, bring it to a two-column format, run it through JHiccup, it'll create a corrected log for you. And this is an example of a before-after correction uh, plotting of a JMeter log with JMeter, which JHiccup used just to fill in the gaps. So it's a good post-processor to fill in coordinate emission correction. That way you don't have to write code. So we're on 11 minutes over. Um, I'm, I'm not gonna spend, a, I have this, you know, this bragging thing about how Zing is great, but let's not do that. Let's just go to questions. Uh, can, can we do the mic? That way I don't have to repeat them. Good. Thanks. Thanks. You said that your intern fixed JMeter. Is that released? Um, it's up on GitHub. It's not very well documented, and it works for certain scenarios. Um, specifically, it's actually a pretty cool fix, but um, what it includes a pattern recognizer that tries to figure out what the pattern of operations you're doing, and and then if it establishes a pattern and there are missing gaps that are larger than the pattern, it'll put in the pattern in the log. And you could do it as a post-processing for the log, or you could do it in real time in JMeter so the graphs just flow nice. Um, the downside is it can only do it if there's a pattern. And unfortunately, it is valid to write a scenario with a random behavior in JMeter. And there's no pattern to that, so there's nothing you can do to correct it. Uh, well, nothing you could do is a little harsh, but we haven't figured it out. Um, so, yeah, it's there. Um, we probably need to put in a little effort to just explain it, but it's two changed files in JMeter um, and, uh, that improve it. It's, and, you know, uh, it's not that hard to do. Well, you just need to realize there's a gap and fill in the gap. It's, it's, you know, that's basically it. The fill-in is basically simulated based on an estimate of what would be happening because you're not really... You can't really measure it. If you have yeah, it's always, it, your problem is somebody erased the bad data. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's well, not there. Clear, yeah, we don't clear. have it, right? Yeah. What we have is evidence that it was missing and knowledge of what the surroundings were, right. and we then project the surroundings into the gap, right? So, so I, I only yeah. brought it up because um, it's, it's, a, it's a workaround as opposed to a fix if you want to get technical about it, because the fix would be to actually collect the, the data that you need to offer the load. So, uh, yes, it is a workaround instead of a fix, and there's categories of the problem. So the absolute fix is to build an asynchronous load generator that never stops doing things because the system isn't responding. Twitter actually has one, and it works, right? And in systems or environments where you don't, like, you know, like multicast input, multicast output, and, and no coordination, that works too. Um, people often tell me, oh, I measure on the wire so there's no problem, right? I, all I have to ask them is, do you use TCP? And if TCP is there, there's gonna be back off. And you, you can't see on the wire that the reason there are no packets is that the client is waiting for an ACK. So all systems that are synchronous, all systems that will back off if you don't respond, have this problem. And when the problem occurs, there is missing data. There's no data to reconstruct. Um, you know, there are all kinds of ways to correct them. So one common one is to say there's a gap. Let's fill the gap in. I know how fast things were going, so I could say how many missing results. I also know how big the gap is. That's a straight linear. It's very simple and easy. The other mode that you could do is to say, well, the request didn't happen, so let's send them after. You can do that. And, the, for example, a constant throughput load generator 
is one that says, well, if I slow down, then let's speed up so average will be the right throughput and things will do that. Unfortunately, if you're not careful, that'll make things twice as bad. That is actually what YCSB does. Uh, it, it sends a request when it's time to send a request, and it's time to send a request when if you should have sent, if there are more requests that should have been sent up to now. So if you stall YCSB for 100 seconds and you wake it up, it'll now send 100 seconds worth of things right there, one after the other. Which seems like, okay, that corrects some of the problem because load-wise you put it back. But what it really did is it erased 10,000 bad results. And then it didn't stop there. It recreated 10,000 good results instead of them. So, yeah. Now, the way to subtly correct for that is if you're going to do that, and you know when it was supposed to be sent rather than when you sent it, you actually have the actual time it took. Like it was supposed to be sent 100 seconds ago, I sent it now, I got the response now. So it took 100 point something seconds. And you'll do that for 10,000 of them. And if you model that right, you'll have the correct thing for actual responses. Because you really, you couldn't have sent one. When you did send one, it should be, the clock should have started when you were supposed to send, not when you did send, and you can correct that. But that's only doable with a load generator. In a real world measurements, you're going to always have to project because you can't measure what would have happened. Um, remember, we're talking stats. And another important thing to note, I, I didn't quite note this there, is when you correct this stuff, you can look and say, wait a minute, overcorrecting or undercorrecting, and which one should it be? So my habit is to usually undercorrect, and the reason I'm doing it is people are nervous about the correction, so for credibility, I say, look, you realize that it's at least this bad, right? But in reality, you're supposed to overcorrect. If you don't know, you're supposed to be as pessimistic as possible. The reason for that is when you report to your customer that the 99th percentile is something, they don't read that as it's at least as bad as this. They read it as at least as good as this which means that you need to be conservative in what you tell them you'll do, which means you need to be aggressive in corrections for things you don't know. So hopefully that's a long-winded explanation and correction. There's a question over there. Um, so another thing that I've noticed that's a little bit weird that we do at, at you know, the job is we'll calculate some We'll calculate like percentiles on individual nodes, like a 99th and a 95th, and and those will get spit out to a log file, and then people start trying to do statistics on those. <laughs> it's my favorite example. Right, and and <laughs> here's I'm here's just wondering, log, yeah. how do you explain to people that uh, I can't? I've been having a hard time trying to explain why, to people yeah. why that's a bad okay. idea. I guess. So I'll give you a foolproof. <clears throat> why is it wrong? I I, I fail. This right. is like ten percent of people do this. So I right. see this yeah. all the time. Basically, you have these nice <clears throat> summary lines. Everybody has a histogram for the one second. So what's the 99th percentile for the run? It's the average of the 99th percentile. Right. Now it's hard to explain to people why. The, I mean, it's not hard, but okay. The 99th percentile is fuzzy. There's a really simple example. There's a max in every line, right? Just ask him what the max for the run is. Is it the average of the maxes or the max of the maxes? Right. So the only valid thing to do with percentiles is to figure out what the maximum one is. There's no other math you can do, and the max is a little aggressive, but there's nothing else you know. The worst case is the worst of the worst cases. The 99th percentile is the worst of the 99th percentiles. It, it, there, you're covered if you do that, right? It's probably better than that, but you. There's no valid math that'll tell you that. And the interval logging for HDR histogram is the thing that allows you to actually do that math that is missing, right? If for every line you had a full HDR histogram and it's highly compressible and it's probably only twice as much data as you're currently logging, then you can do the math on the counts and then compute the, the actual thing and all the library, the library just does it for you. So, any other questions? Good, I exhausted you. So um, but then we're done. Oh, what, one question for you guys, though. How many of you recognize some of the things in this talk in your organization? OK, good. That's what I meant by the oh shit talk. OK, thanks. Thank you.